Good evening. My name is Ray Silverman. I'm the director of the Museum Studies Program here at the University of Michigan. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Tapsell from the University of Otago in New Zealand. At the University of Otago, uh, he serves as the chair in Ma Maori Studies and the dean of Te Tumu, the School of Maori, Pacific, and Indigenous Studies. This evening, Professor Tapsell will speak about his groundbreaking work with Maori communities in New Zealand. He has developed new strategies for engaging communities whose histories and cultures are presented in the museum. His work is grounded in the premise that curating culture requires the redistribution of curatorial authority between the museum and the community, and a rethinking of notions of ownership, ownership of things, as well as ideas. Paul Tapsell holds a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Auckland. He completed a doctorate in museum ethnography from Oxford University in 1998 with a thesis entitled Taonga, a tribal response to museums. From 1999 to 2000, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Cross-Cultural Research at the Australian National University. Before assuming his current position, Professor Tapsell was a lecturer in anthropology at Auckland University. Professor Tapsell's research interests include Maori identity in 21st century New Zealand, cultural heritage in museums, Maori values within governance policy frameworks, indigenous entrepreneurial leadership, genealogical mapping of the tribal landscapes, and Te Arawo, historical and ge genealogical knowledge. The author of numerous articles, Professor Tapsell, has published two books. In 2000, the book Pukaki, A Comet Returns, and more recently in 2006, Kotawa, uh, excuse me, The Maori Ancestors of New Zealand. While pursuing his studies and teaching, Professor Tapsell has been involved in and with a number of museums in New Zealand. In 2000, he and a team of colleagues were the recipients of funding from the Marsden Fund, which permitted them to work for more than four years on a research, writing, and development project that culminated in the exhibition Kotawa at the Auckland Museum. Tonight, Professor Tapsell will speak about this exhibition and his efforts to develop and implement principles by which, in his words, indigenous communities can become co-producers of ancestrally bounded knowledge within museum contexts. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tapsell to U of M. Um, just my first words uh, to acknowledge the ancestral landscape on which we're all sitting, or well, in my case standing, and the, um, those who have come before us, and in particular the ancestral backgrounds that each of you carry that brings you here today so that we share this moment and it'll probably be the only moment that all of us are going to be together in our lifetimes and the exact number of people we have here. Um, so hopefully it's a memorable moment, um, something to reflect on and to transpose into a museum context. Every time we walk into a museum we're participating in a moment, a moment of history in the now what challenges us is who is presenting that history and who is creating the framework around the context of now. Uh, this presentation um, is a little ad hoc. I began putting it together a year ago. Um, kind of didn't quite make it a year ago. A few things got in the way, but now that I'm here I'd like to share with you some images and uh, give you a background, a context to the culture out of which I have arrived and uh, provide the framework on which our culture um, is premised and that's the Māori culture 
but from a tribal perspective in counter-distinction to an ethnic identity of homogenizing a whole lot of tribes together. So uh, I, I specialize, I guess, in accountability and kinship terms to a particular landscape and how that accountability can be transposed into a museum context and displayed or re-presented to a wider general public. The, um, before I get into the audio-visual presentation, it's just a few key words I'll throw up here. Uh, the first one's of course are in Māori, and conceptually the word whakapapa, which means to layer, to na layer knowledge, works around the idea of belonging as opposed to ownership. So a Māori worldview at a in a tribal perspective is that you belong to the landscape, you belong to your ancestors, you belong to your people. There is no such Māori word as that can translate into ownership. It's all about being accountable. The second word, whenua, literally translates into the word meaning placenta, the placenta of the land, the land that nourishes you, from which you are born, and eventually to which your mortal remains will return to replenish the next generation or generations later. From that you survive, not just in your lifetime, but for generations to come, as has been generations in the past. The third word, rangatiratanga, is in relationship to chieftainship. Chieftainship in terms of belonging is best translated as trusteeship. The right to lead is balanced with the obligations of service, which conceptually we use the word manakitanga. And the final word, kaitiakitanga, which is about caring, protecting, or can best be translated as sustainability. Again, sustainability of your people is about sustainability of your resources. Each of those words is a way into understanding tribal Māori society as I've been raised through my um, lifetime and in which I've been able, along with a number of my elders, to insert into a way of delivering an exhibition within a museum context. So for now, I'm just going to show you an image here of a lake. Um, it's taken from an island. It's a volcanically formed cauldron or a lake, um, and the island itself is the remains of a basalt core, and the rest of the basin has filled with water a few thousand years ago. The very place where this picture is taken uh, looks back towards a peninsula that's known as Ōwhata and to a New Zealander or to a tourist or to a visitor like yourself you're looking at a scenic landscape. To a descendant of the land who would be standing about here in the photograph Looking back, you'll be standing at a place called Waikimi here. It's an ancestral hot pool, a geothermal hot pool, which my ancestors have taken a bath in for almost 20 generations. It's also the place to where my ancestors 12 generations ago swam from this point here by moonlight to this point here, so that she could be with a young man who was forbidden to marry her. And in the process of creating that marriage comes the genealogical accounting of time through ancestors. And this image here is of an object, a flute, actually made from human bone, of the spiritual leader, the Tohonga, who was brought across the water after the marriage, um, sorry, prior to the marriage, he was, you know, I don't want to go into detail, those will miss the whole point. But anyway, he was, he was unfortunate. His life was taken by the leader of the tribe that's on this side, and the flute was what this young man played and attracted one of the girls from that tribe the spiritual leader came from under the spell 
and married and a whole new tribe was formed of which I'm a descendant. And through time, other ancestors appear and are represented through objects. They are ancestors. In this case, we're looking at a gateway that stood five metres tall. His name was Pukaki. And he again is three of, about five generations down from this ancestor represented here. And then another four generations later, we then have um, my great-great-grandmother and one of the very earliest ever captures of uh, and our ancestors by painting by an outsider. So uh, without going any further on that, I, what I'm going to show you now is a DVD presentation and this will give us an opportunity to get a sense of identity to landscape. What you're about to hear in the first instance is a lament that's been sung by a young woman whose great 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 grandfather was about to be hanged by the British for a crime he did not commit. He sang it as the noose was put round his head and his people were there to hear him sing this song and have carried it as a memory through to today. He was um, finally pardoned in 18, uh, 1989, 100, almost 150 years after the, or 130 years after he had been hanged. So um, I'll start with that and then the next clip will be a modern day interaction of tribes greeting outsiders onto a particular marae courtyard space. So it's a ritual exchange of encounter. Um, and these are the, just to give you some substance and context behind the exhibition Kotawa. So um, normally I'd be running this with two projections so that you could have them simultaneously and it would be a little bit easier to follow. Uh, but we're using, um, fortunately we've got something to project. So we'll, um, Chris, if we can go ahead with that. Kore te takiri e tu te nei ki te moe nga kai te huri te tangata te nei au kai te rawe ki he pono te ki nei takurau hia ki te moe nga koe a kai Te tangata ma te kauau ki a te uira whakarewha Te titiro te huki ngā ia hautiti he warewa Re noa te eke noa i te kaipuke he ahimu Mura te pānga mai o te whakamā me kaueki Ta fiti hei ho mai mo te meka meka te rerenga O te rā ko te kāwana kei uropi mānai Ki mai me tau au ki te tau ati hei tu Taki e mo te kua hao te pau a kahara mai Nei au ka tūra ki mate ki te moe ngai Ki te tau au ki te tau ati hei tu 
hopefully provided you a just a, a snapshot of what Māori culture is about. But what you also experience is what the people who went to Kotawa to the exhibition experience. For some, it was the first time they'd ever encountered anything that was even Māori. They'd have walked up to straight off a boat or straight off a plane in the Auckland International Airport or wherever they'd landed. They'd gone into a museum space and they encountered these powerful images, these, uh, this powerful emotion that's been released through song, through um, music, through original composition, ancestral composition, and in particular, the objects themselves, which we call taonga. The taonga are seen as vehicles of um, ancestrally layered knowledge that Whakapapura talked about before. It gives you a sense of place in a landscape. And from one tribal group to another, you have different taonga, but each of those taonga are specifically representative to a time and a place, an event that occurred within a whakapapa. So the ancestor of 13 generations ago would have one particular taonga perhaps that we hold on to today, so we recount that story. So uh, when we brought together, well, with the whole idea of creating an exhibition from a tribal Māori-centric perspective within a very um, rarefied museum space that is especially the Auckland Museum, one of the oldest public museums in the world. Its doors had already been open for 150 years to the public. Uh, we had a real challenge. Um, I was fortunate, as Ray was explaining, to um, have been part of a Marsden Fund. It's a, um, it's a Royal Society of New Zealand controlled research fund and I was able to direct that money towards investigating 247 of these objects, these taonga, that happened to be in the Auckland Museum collection. Up to then they were displayed because of their aesthetic quality, not because of the knowledge that sat behind them and had been um, of very important um, reference to landscapes at the time of gifting. So the, um, the first thing I embarked on with a team, curatorial team, was to begin investigating these 247 objects and start to pull out the archival material on them. And we quickly discovered that the collector, whose name was Gilbert Meir, was also um, known throughout the land by Māori as Tawa. Tawa Tafiti. He was one of the very first English colonial births in the country. His parents were missionaries and he was born in a large family in the northern part of New Zealand, Aotearoa, and grew up amongst Māori. And by the age of 19, he had been fluent in Māori when the new governors were coming into the country after our treaty was signed. He became their um, translator and accompanied them to different um, tribal regions. And so from a very young age, he started to have a reputation and exposure to wider tribes. By the 1860s, um, it's him on the right, very right right now, by the age, and there he's in his mid-30s. By that time, he was now leading a government force made up of friendly Maori tribes against the not-so-friendly Māori tribes, a very common story throughout the colonised world. But what stood him apart from all the other people, non-Māori, that were involved was to respect both his enemy and those he fought alongside had for him. And in time he became a land agent um, representing the government and he was presented um, a number of these ancestral objects, taonga, that you're seeing now on the screen in relation to particular landscapes that he did, that uh, those tribes did not want to lose through the colonial process. So each of these objects were actually contracts of trust between the government and the gifting tribe. So in the true sense, a prestation. And they occurred within those marae spaces, in that space where you saw those two men doing a ritual challenge. It occurred in that type of um, moment. And there he is again as an older man, 
he was, and he knew what he was receiving. He was fluent in Māori, he understood the intent of these taonga that were being gifted. He wrote down the stories that were presented at the same time. So these taonga weren't just given over as something pretty, something looking cool. They were given over with a recitation of the whakapapa, of the ancestors that were related to it, with an acknowledgement to the landscape that ancestor was associated with, and no doubt at the time why this land should not be taken by the Crown, by the government. We want to hold on to this land. So with that premise, that, um, and finding that knowledge, we as a team thought this would make a great exhibition, and so um, we started discussing ways in which to exhibit these very powerful objects that Gilbert Mayer had received, and then had placed in the Auckland Museum. And, um, and the stories they represented. We also came to understand that each of these taonga had a, um, was still alive within the wider community. The contract they represented was still remembered by descendants four or five generations later. So um, we were holding on to literally live contracts that were expressed in terms of um, carving of wood, bone, stone and weaving. When we brought this information back to the communities, source communities, they had lost sight of the object themselves, but had not lost sight of the contract that sat behind them. They knew the landscapes that had still been taken despite the gifting or the promises that were made in the 1860s, 70s and 80s through to 1920s. They also understood the, um, that this was the first time the Auckland Museum was turning up to ask them what they remembered without asking for things back, as in terms of objects. And we were able to start to repatriate the knowledge we held back to them. So a dialogue, a relationship started to occur. As this information started to collect, we went on four field research trips. We also took with us um, uh, uh, a camera, moving camera as well as still pictures, collected 100 hours of footage, over 3,000 images of our interactions with these different communities. So the second clip that you saw, that was a, a, um, a collage of a number of those interactions during the time of engaging with these communities prior to the opening of, and up to the opening of the exhibition. During this time of collecting, um, we arrived at one marae to, to discover that their house had been literally burnt down by one of their own descendants. The descendant was about 13 years old. He was high on um, meth methamphetamine, and he thought that um, the house was evil and was saying things to him, and so he petrol bombed it. Um, as the Auckland Museum, we were able to provide support through the conservation process through to eventually the reopening of the house. So a demonstration of a museum being in service to the community, an original source community. In return, they gifted this ancestor who had survived the fire and is the heart of the house for us to use in the exhibition for the three years it travelled, to act as a guardian, a kaitiaki, um, for our, our journey with this exhibition idea. The um, concept for the exhibition came out of one of the taonga we were looking at and there were 27 taonga objects that were incredibly powerful and you could map across the landscape so it gave a nice geographical spread across the North Island. And one of, or two of them were shaped, they're shaped like a, um, we call them a wakahuya. They're a container into which treasures were placed. And this container, almost like a, a, a canoe, about so big, would hang from the rafters of a meeting house, of an ancestral house, and the chiefs, the leaders, would keep their most prized possessions in that. And the idea then through our team and through um, especially a Māori architect, um, we worked out that why not make the exhibition sit in one of these precious canoes, except we'll make it 13 metres long and almost 8 metres, 9 metres wide. Um, so as we're bringing these taonga, some of them still back in regional museums, 
collecting them back to, into Auckland space, Auckland Museum space, we started to build this, um, this canoe to contain the tower. We also wanted to display the visual aspect of our engagement and fortunately we're also using really high quality sound pickups so we got um, many hours of songs and narrative um, and haka and ritual captured on, on um, audio sound that then we could put into the space. But what was perplexing us through this whole thing was to um, make sure that we created an exhibition that did not have glass cabinets, that the ancestors, which from a Māori perspective is exactly what these taonga were, they were our ancestors, were in a position of being superordinate to us, that we became the object of their gaze as the living. So we started to um, think about the layering now of us as the object being pushed against the walls, the living. In front of us, then, meeting in front of us was the protection between life and death, those that the elders fulfill. So we had then the elders formed the gunwale of the canoe. The canoe itself then contains the ancestors in our position looking down on us. And then above that, like the roof, uh, the ceilings of the meeting house, um, was the projections of the ancestors that had since passed in the landscapes out of which these contracts had come. Um, all the light to the exhibition came out of the plinth, out of this waka, not too literal, plinth, and the projections came out of it from in the interior as well. So it was creating a sense of the canoe floating in the, in the gallery and floating through our time and continuing on a voyage that will go beyond our lifetimes. And to be able to be in the presence, for example, of an ancestor that um, is 26 generations old is really powerful. And this is why such powerful ancestors were given to Gilbert Mayer in the first place. They were, the, the tribal groups were seeking critical relationships to try and protect and survive the colonial process. And those contracts, as I say, they continued to still be extent when we started visiting those communities. We were um, worried visiting the communities because most of us in the Māori team, we'd grown up um, in urban environments. And so um, for many of them, they hadn't interacted before with the tribal context or in any meaningful way. So to find yourself in a space that's very ritualised, dealing with elders and a sense of possible hostility um, we had to think of how we entered into those communities and protect ourselves as well. Um, the communities that we came from wasn't so bad because we had kin relations that could come to our help, our aid, but other communities we entered into in which our team had no kin relationship, uh, we ensured that we had elders come with us to be able to um, protect us in case the need arose. As it was, it never did. And one of the most, um, one of the most uh, interesting interactions we had was when I sat down with this elder and his family um, after we'd been greeted and there was silence for 10 minutes and we just sat there, it was just total silence and you, you know, within a non-Māori context that could become quite uncomfortable within a Māori context you want to crawl up and die because silence in the Māori world is like you've really stuffed up, something's wrong here and, and um, the anticipation of what this elder was going to say and you didn't dare speak first, it was for him to speak and eventually the first words he spoke at the time was your ancestor killed my ancestor and you, you know, you're really on the spot. Fortunately, I knew which ancestor he was talking about, and I then was able to retort, and that's why I'm here today. And he nodded his head and said, let's eat. So um, you had to be quick. <laughs> um, we also had um, musicians that were descended from these taonga be able to perform so the soundtrack you heard, that's all original soundtrack that's been developed by Indigenous musicians um, and in collaboration with non-Indigenous. Um, this person that's the elder that had said, your ancestor ate my ancestor or killed my ancestor, he ended up telling the story and releasing the knowledge of that very first clip you saw of his 
granddaughter singing that song about his great grandfather, which was all around um, our ancestors fighting each other. A very sad story. It was the person who was hanged. Nine other chiefs were hanged. Eight other chiefs were hanged with him um, for a murder that occurred. The killing of a Christ, well, of a priest by another ancestor who happened to come from my tribe. He had done the killing as payment for the church failing to protect his wife and children and about 60 other uh, women, children and old men who had taken refuge within a church under the safety of, quote, God. At the time, he was himself a preacher and when he discovered that the priests of that church had turned their back on the church and let the British open fire on it and then burn it to the ground, he took off his collar and vowed, the next priest I come across, um, I will take off his head and eat his eyes, which he duly did. And that priest had no idea what was coming. He had nothing to do with the original uh, hara, the original crime, but he was a man of the cloth and revenge was to be sought. That's not to say this was right or wrong, but what it inevitably did was gave the Crown, the government, an excuse to enter into that landscape and confiscate 66,000 acres and turn it over to British settlers. In the process of doing that, they also took the neighbouring tribes' land as well because they were close, not so closely, but they were related. And it just happened that these two tribes were on the best land in the whole of the North Island and the Bay of Plenty. As a further payment, the other tribe that also got tied up in this revenge by the Crown now and taking the land, they then came to the, the man who had been hanged and, his, and his, um, the other chiefs and they killed all their male children, raped their women and took the girls as slaves. So we have a, this is all happening supposedly after the treaty is signed and when um, we're meant to be as Māori treated as equal British citizens like anyone else. Um, that then ha that happened in 1866, and then in 1877, only 11 years later, the government then declared the treaty under which we were meant to be protected, and which our chiefs had signed because it opened up opportunity to trade and industry, to um, to the marketplace in Australia. Um, to new medicines and new opportunities I thought British represented. In 1877, the treaty was then declared a nullity. And from that point, 1877 to 1975, Māori were non-citizens in New Zealand in terms of being treaty partners. In, 18, in 1975, uh, the third Labour government came in, the treaty was reinstated, and in 1989, Mokomoko, that, that leader was finally given a pardon about 140 years after the crime. And the original person who did the crime, the killing, he was later captured three years later, he was hanged as well. The meeting house you're looking at at the moment, that's my home house, that's our ancestral house, and it's one of my um, relations. But it's a representative of the many houses and the, and the conversations we had. Um, and then in, on the 10th of June in 2005, after going back to the community, sharing what knowledge we had, showing what we hoped to do with the exhibition, um, and more knowledge being passed to us, more songs being passed to us, we were able to invite the communities to come to the first opening of Kotawa up at the Auckland Museum. And that was just the start. What happened there was that it wasn't us, the young Māori that were working in the museum that welcomed them into the space, it was the local tribe. The local tribe by now, th through the treaty process, had gained governance status within the overall governance of the museum. And they had set in place protocols that anything Māori that occurs within the museum at a governance level that tribe, Ngāti Whātua, were the, were the bosses. And the governance of the museum deferred to Ngāti Whātua, to that tribe, the people of Whātua, the people of the Auckland region. In return, they then transmitted the Māori accountability to us as the workers in a position of office. 
so that we could do all of this that you're seeing up on the screen now. So we were, every time we entered into any tribal landscape, even my own, we were going there under the mandate of the local tribe of the Auckland Museum because they, for better or worse, had had these ancestors, these taonga, sitting on their landscape without their authority, without their permission, since 1890 when Gilbert Mayer had put them in there. And we're talking just 427 of these objects, these taonga, these ancestors. Bear in mind there's actually 60,000 ancestors sitting in the Auckland Museum, of which the same tribe, Ngāti Whātua, had absolutely no say over, until in 1996, the new legislation the government introduced said that a Māori advisory committee could be formed and a representative from that committee had a place, official place, on the governing trust board of 10. One out of 10, it's not a huge amount, but, it's, uh, but it means you're actually inside the door and you can start to speak and start to explain what those objects you have in the museum might mean from a Māori perspective. So five years later, the Kotaro exhibition project started to roll, and that's when we started to give real official, effective, exhibitionary meaning to a position of governance. This is uh, just a, you'll see it coming and going, but this is how we built the exhibition. We wanted to build it so it was transportable, and after it had been exhibited at Auckland, could enter into wider regional communities of the tribes. Um, and it ended up going into um, eight, if not nine, different communities. And with each movement from one tribal region to another, starting with the home people of Auckland, they accompanied us and passed the exhibition over to the next tribe, which was down in Wellington. And then the Wellington people, when the exhibition finished there, they then trans came with the transported the, the exhibition and passed it over to the northern people of Whangarei, of Ngāpui. And then when Ngāpui had finished, and every tribe took this job so seriously, from a, from a um, museum perspective, if something got stolen, uh, you know, it might be worth $80,000 on the open market if you, if you went to Sotheby's. Um, it'll be an insurance write-off and someone's head might roll for that occurring. From a Māori perspective, if something got stolen and it was on your land and you were the, the tribe that was meant to be looking after it from a Māori values perspective, you would be carrying the stigma of that loss and the loss of, re loss of face in the relationship with the tribe that belonged to that object for generations. So each of those tribes, when they eventually became the kaitiaki, the caretakers, the custodians of this exhibition, they took the job so seriously that in one case, the elders and the local Māori wardens, um, which is a group that's there to help with our youth at risk, they actually slept in the space to protect it, which um, kind of blew away the security of a lot of museums that you would even allow even to think of someone sleeping over within a museum space. But you know, up to 20 of them would sleep there each night and take turns so that no one ever left these ancestors unaccompanied. So from the start of the opening rituals of the exhibition right through to the end, there was always someone awake with these, with these ancestors to make sure that they weren't left unaccompanied. The exhibition eventually travelled um, over to Australia to reach out to our youth at risk living in the Sydney area of the Australian Museum. But again, we followed the same protocol. It wasn't to them the exhibition was passed to, it was to the local Aboriginal peoples of Sydney. And it was done in such a way that the Australian Museum had never even considered that they had a local Indigenous people until we went and found them and then we said, we want you to receive these taonga, care for them, and when you're finished, we want you to deliver them to the next venue back in New Zealand. And the Australian Museum was very resistant and reluctant, but eventually, without going into detail, it went ahead. And in it going ahead, it created an incredible relationship that is sustained to today. It also um, enabled the local Māori community to engage with the Australian Museum, which has a lot of taonga in it as well. So um, it opened up 
new conversations within an international space. The Aboriginal people brought it back to Oportiki, back to that same place where Mukumuku was hung, right opposite the church where the priest had his head cut off and rolled down the aisle, and the eyes eaten in front of the, the, uh, the quaking parishioners that were all township people, um, that were of non-Māori. Those descendants were there at the opening in the museum directly across the church, as were the descendants of Mokomoku who had been killed. For the first time, both communities came together and the object over which took place within, that they all focused on within the exhibition, was the hatchet that had chopped off the head of the priest. And that became the, the taonga, the ancestor called Tuafe of uh, reconciliation, to which both cultures could speak to and start to forgive each other after 140 years of neither side talking with each other, the Māori descendants being the other that were in the gangs and all the social ills that were occurring and being pushed right up to the back into the, into the hills where there was no, no fertile lands and lived in reservation style and having to go to the same schools where the children of the very wealthy Pākehā settlers from one generation to the next were prospering. So um, again, a way in which Kotawa reached into the community. It also set a platform because they looked at the governance at the Auckland Museum. They just were forming this new museum out of the old one. They're being totally white dominated and they were looking at a 50% equal governance and have since put in place of Māori local tribes with their settlers. Um, and it was great to have Kotawa as a, as a part of that reconciliation. Um, some next tribe we went to was really problematic. There was another taonga in that tribe, uh, another peace offering, and they were the tribe now that had raped the first tribe that I talked about before. They now received the exhibition, but they had gone through settlement. The government had given a huge settlement for them for what had happened. With taking of the land, it wasn't anything to do with them. But they were not happy with receiving these taonga onto their landscape. 13 of the 16 community tribes, they boycotted it because they saw the collector as having led the massacres of um, some of those communities when he was fighting with the militia. And, and even though I tried to explain it was his brother, not him, that didn't matter. Same family, close enough as far as we're concerned. Funnily enough, just like how the government thought, well, you know, tribe next door, close enough, we'll take their land. So it's funny how history repeats itself in a resistance sort of way. Nevertheless, the three marae that did support and opened it and provided the ritual protection for the whole duration, they reported back afterwards that all those marae that hadn't supported had quietly come in to see that object, that beginning of the petition for the land return, which had finally happened only two years earlier. So uh, it was, you know, they had to hold their mana, their position, their authority, and show that they weren't going to bow to anyone. And for them, the Auckland Museum was still a representation of colonisation. Us working in there as Māori, trying to break out and create a new way of seeing things. Uh, they had aroha for us, they had respect, but, um, but they weren't going to um, be seen to be openly supporting. Thereafter, it then went back into the tribe from which the person who had committed the original killing and entered into that space. And each time we went to a new space, we stopped at the local marae, we stopped at the local schools, um, which was the museum didn't officially know about, and we'd open the back of the truck and we'd bring these objects out, these taonga, and we'd lay them out so that the local people there could see them in the context of their own community. And we'd let them be there for three or four hours sometimes so that the, um, the young and the old could talk about them and talk about the landscape around how they exactly related. So it was a, an opportunity of education <coughs> that you could never do in the museum context. Going back into museums, you have to then provide visual images like we're providing now to try and give a sense of the context out of which it came. Um, the, um, the last um, problematic thing we had in the whole exhibition was the final, after the final venue finished, 
and we were returning the exhibition back to Ngāti Whātua. These are the three elders of Ngāti Whātua. And in returning it, when we started, we'd been under a director who was supportive of the overall concept. When we came home three years later with the exhibition, we were under a new director who um, was not so interested in things Māori or in what this was um, providing to a wider community. And the, um, the receipt of the taonga back by Ngāti Whātua was very contested, not from a Māori perspective, but from, a, from the Māori that were now working in the museum, and it was my last day working there. And um, in the presentation of the taonga back to Ngāti Whātua, we didn't present it back to the museum, we presented it back to the home tribe. Um, and the home tribe, in receiving that, they honoured they honored my tribe, who had buried Gilbert Mayer Tawa. And in doing that, they also presented me back to my people. So I'd, li I'd lived under their control, under their authority, customary authority for eight years as um, their worker, as their director Māori at the museum, and with the completion of this exhibition, that's the team that was there, um, myself and one of the other members of the team from my tribe, that's when we, um, our resignation became effective and we were passed back. So, um, yeah, that's uh, just an uh, image from the opening in Sydney um, with the Māori that live over in Australia. and. It's a bit like the Irish, you know, people are more Irish when they're not in Ireland. Uh, same for Māori, you find them overseas and they're staunchly Māori. Come back home, it's like, here's a tea towel, go try some dishes in the kitchen. Um, a bit of a pragmatic. For those from New Zealand, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, within the exhibition, it became a project. The, sorry, the stone you see carried there, that carried the life essence of the exhibition. So it went from, that was what the holding tribe passed over to the receiving tribe. So it, and each time that stone collected the authority of each of the custodian tribes to eventually when it came back to the marae in Rotorua, from where I spoke originally about the swimming of the women across the lake, uh, that stone was then put on the grave of Gilbert Meir, the original collector, who had been buried by that tribe as one of their own and because of the respect he had commanded during his lifetime. Um, so the stone stayed there and it's still there to this day um, at his graveside. We also produced a book where um, it's really important within an exhibition context, I believe, to produce something that lasts longer than the exhibition and provides a, um, a centering of the knowledge for future uh, descendants to access. We produce it in Māori as well as English um, so that these young people can have access to it in the language. For them, first language is Māori. Um, and we also um, we, we produced a TV documentary, six-part TV um, dramatisation documentary, um, which all in the Māori language, um, as well as a full feature documentary and um, a Māori calendar, 18-month calendar that looked at all the cycles of the moon and planting and fishing and brought that together under the kaupapa, under this, under this project, um, as well as um, also producing a lot of these t-shirts with Kotaur on that we gave to each of the people who acted as guides within the exhibition. So a major element of the exhibition was having well, what you call docents, I guess, but we called them kaiarahi. They were descendants of the taonga, of the objects, and they could talk about them in the first person to all the visitors. But the emotion of belonging to that ancestor and explain who they were looking at and give it a context that you could never get out of a book or out of a, just listening to the music. There were no labels in the exhibition. The exhibition was completely label free so that you had to engage with the sounds and the, and the sight and, and the objects themselves. But we had produced a six um, page booklet 
A4 size that folded out into, um, and on that was each of the objects and those were the labels. So every person who came to the exhibition got one of those to take away, plus um, the website that they could then go into. And behind the whole exhibition was a database project of databasing not only the 247 tāngā in, in the whole collection, but um, the other 1,500 tāngā that are on display in the Auckland Museum, um, which was an ongoing project at the time I left, but has um, since been ceased under the, under the new director of the time. So um, this was the final venue, uh, one of the last openings, and that little head just popping up. That's my son now that's... Um, I look at that, he's now about up to here on me. So uh, it's uh, how quickly an exhibition will mark your ageing when you look back. Um, there's, uh, yeah, for me, it's, it was a, a project that lasted from 2003 to 2008. That's five years of my life. And getting involved in museums, I think one of the neatest things about working in a museum and curating in a museum is that you live it, you breathe it, you love it, you embody it, but you've got to be able to let go of it. And, and when you do get into this curating into the, into the communities, although you have to let go of the museum, if you're part of that community, what you're creating is a relationship and you're providing a service to your people or to other people's descendants of these objects, that's a lifetime um, of satisfaction. So to see our target audience, which were young people up to the age of 12 or 13, those that had like the boy that had um, firebombed our marae, had burnt it. They were our target audience. And everyone else, we invited to participate alongside them. Uh, the most moving moment in this whole exhibition was when we had a group of 20 young men that were all pee addicts and were at-risk youth, early um, 20s, had come into the ex exhibition space all our security were like on, they were you know, ready for something terrible to happen. They came into the exhibition itself with um, about 10 attendants that had travelled with them from the mental um, health hospital they'd come out of. And they were very noisy. You could hear them coming, and I happened to be in the space at the time. You could hear them coming from before you could see them. And when they entered into the space within about 90 seconds, they just went silent. And they were silent for the best part of 20 minutes. And some of them just lay down on the floor just looking at the images. Some were sitting back, others were like leaning over. Um, and the, the leader of, the, of, their, of their, um, those who were protecting them or, or, or guiding them, their caretakers, I just made a comment. He came to see me and, and I just made a comment and said, oh, you know, how do you think it's working? He just went, this has never happened with them. I've been working with these guys for two years. I've never seen them actually go into conscious time now. He said, this is, he said, this is really amazing, this uh, interaction that's occurring. So getting that interaction, getting them to engage with their ancestor or an ancestor within a space that gives them a sense of identity, uh, that was the key to this. Uh, we had no money to work with. We. Um, the museum was sceptical all the way through that this was even a doable exhibition. They were quite happy if we just put them in a couple of glass cases up in a gallery that was dedicated to the exhibition originally in 2002, 2003, way at the back of the museum. Um, we happened to get lucky to get it into the main premier part of the museum for a 12-week slot when another exhibition fell over. And we had gone to Sony, New Zealand. We'd gone to the biggest trucking company in South Auckland where all this at-risk youth are, main freight. And we said, this is what we want to do. And each of them gave the equivalent of over $100,000 of sponsorship so that we could get it done. When my director found out that I'd got all this outside money, um, he wasn't so happy with me because he'd gone to Sony himself for another exhibition he was working on and he'd been turned down. So you could say the battle lines were drawn. So if you're going to work in museums, really run some risk management before you go and ask any sponsors to make sure your director hasn't been there first. Otherwise, uh, life can be difficult. Um, but anyway, we managed to muddle our way through. We managed to get the exhibition open. We managed to um, share it with over 100,000 of our community and enter into spaces that these Taonga hadn't been back to for over 130 years. In the process of that, we found out that Gilbert Mayer himself, who supposedly didn't have any children, 
had at least four genealogical lines of descendants. So you know, part of the Māori hospitality always was not only did you gift over a tāngwa, you also gifted over a beautiful young lady. And it was very um, inappropriate to refuse such hospitality. And Gilbert Mayer understood that, and his wife at home probably didn't know any better. So, uh, the, the, so the outcome of that relationship, around about a thousand living descendants today who protect the essence in a physical, genetic form of the receiver of these, of these tāngwa. The images, all of these images you're seeing, the ones that are moving slowly, were pro the projections in the exhibition itself. They were um, directly hovering above six key taonga. One of them was Tuhafi, the, 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 the murder that we talked about. Another one was the flute, Muri Rangaranga, that was used to um, lure this young woman, Hinemo, across the lake. Another one was the cloak of Tikoti, a great prophet, Māori prophet, who previous years had fought against Gilbert Mere, and they'd come this close each time to killing each other but had never succeeded. And then in a chance meeting two or three years later when the great war leader had turned to becoming a man of peace and a prophet that today has a huge church following called the Ringatū Faith, the upraised, ha upraised hand, he happened chance on Gilbert Mayer in a little settlement and Gilbert Mayer was in the hotel staying overnight in a place called Matata. Tukorti was camped with his followers a little bit further out of the town and one of the members of his group had discovered Gilbert Mayer was there so he rushed back to Tukorti, this leader, and said, Gilbert Mayer is a Tawa, Tawa is uh, ki, ki, ki rote te whare, um, waipiro, he's in, the, he's in the house, the establishment. So Te Korti picked up all his men and said, come with me, and they went and stood in front of the hotel and then um, called out to Tawa to come out. And when he came out, Tawa, Gilbert Mayer, he, according to this account that was given by James Cowan, he held himself erect and he went along each of these men that were standing at arms with shovels or anything else they could find. But these were all men that had fought against Gilbert Mayer and had not been captured or killed by him. And they all stood to attention and he went along and pretended to inspect their collars and do a sort of a play on the old military way of standing, standing at arms. And then eventually he got to Tikorti at the end. And with Tikorti he pressed noses. And this is our ritual way of sharing breath with each other, acknowledging the very creation of life itself right back to, who knows, the Big Bang. Um, and pressing noses, he then stepped back and Tikorti took his cloak off himself which was a feature part of this exhibition, placed it around Gilbert Mayer's shoulders and said, although this rain cape is too small to clothe you, let it, let it um, embrace you from head to toe with my love. A reconciliation. When I shared that information with his descendants, the Tuhoi people who have to this day been bitterly opposed to the crown, to the government and everything that has occurred, when they heard those words of Te Korti, their prophet, um, which had not been shared for or heard by the tribe, their leader turned to me and said, you now have the support of our tribe for this exhibition. Um, so just the power of words that are themselves the taonga. Knowledge that sits behind these objects is the real taonga, the real treasure that is maintained. The objects become the portal to accessing that story, that narrative, that point of identity that locks you into a landscape. And in due course, from one generation to the next, you perform these taonga at critical moments in the survival life of your tribe. So when a great chief dies, these taonga would be brought out and placed on the body. And these taonga became the embodiment of that ancestor. For that moment, three or four days of, of mourning, the elders would speak to that taonga as the ancestors who have come back from the spirit land to gather the new ancestor, the new, newly deceased, and guide him or her back to our ancestral home. That is the most critical role that these taonga play. 
and knowing who those taonga represent and the power they have and each time that occurs it just gives them even more power more presence and affects us in a way that makes us maori so when we look at that flute the bone flute um, you're looking at an object that to us is muri rangaranga and there's over 27,000 of us now descended today from that one moment where that flute played an important role in our identity. So we call ourselves the people of Fikowe. There's final images here. Uh, the beautiful thing that we were able to do at the end of Kotawa was to return this ancestor back home. By this time, the house had been rebuilt and um, the family that belonged to the child that had caused the damage, reconciliation had occurred and we had this magnificent opening. The whole community got behind to rebuild the house. Um, we even managed to get sprinkler systems put in to prevent it ever happening again. And he was able now, after being on his travels, to come home carrying the hopes and aspirations of all those younger members of the tribe that lived elsewhere in the world back into that marae space, back to a reconnection. Something that when those young people go home, they'll see that ancestor sitting in that house and they'll remember him from when they met him during Kotawa. Some of the terms we use um, within the Māori space but to translate them into museolo museological talk, it's like source communities. And at the moment, the literature talks about source community as just being one source community, the source community of the object of the taonga, such as um, te ao te atua there. But what we've got to now keep in mind is there are actually two communities, apart from the museum, that are present in any relationship. It's the home community as well that the museum rests upon. So where the taonga sitting in the museum, the taonga, the object, they belong to a source community. But the museum they're resting in belongs to a home community. And that home community is the community that carries those obligations. As I mentioned before, when each of these, each, of, each time the taonga travel to a new community, it was not done lightly, the passing of that stone that represented the whole collection from one tribal group to the other. All the inherent obligations of protection were passed over as well. And two of the tribal communities we hoped to visit, they chose that the risk was too great for the Taonga to visit and the museums, not because they didn't want them, but they felt the museum wouldn't be able to protect them and support them in that protection. So rather than carry the risk that something would occur, the elders are very much about heritage and protection. They chose to support the exhibition not going there. And there were a total of five museum tribal groups that chose not to take Kotawa um, because the risk outweighed the benefit. But those groups still came to the neighbouring tribal group to see their ancestors and brought their children as well. Um, so uh, some of the museums have not yet in New Zealand got to that space where they've got a relationship with their tribal groups. And in some cases where they have had a relationship, that relationship hasn't been maintained and it's dropped away. So if there's one lesson we got out of this whole exhibition, it was the relationships have to be proactively and ongoingly maintained. You can't just form the relationship and then expect it to be sustainable on its own. And unfortunately, the Kotawa process, after we'd finished, um, we had a team of 14, there's only three left working at the museum. And for those three to try and sustain that relationship is really difficult. However, the relationship with the individuals that were in the team continues even though they don't work at the museum anymore. So you as a curator, working with these communities, you actually take the relationship with you. 
it doesn't stay with an office, it doesn't stay with an institution, it actually stays with you, you become the embodiment of that relationship. So the biggest lesson um, that we have to learn as anthropologists is that when you go into the field and you engage with the community and they share knowledge with you, and it's really important knowledge to their identity, they're trusting you to handle that knowledge in a way to which they um, might get benefit, but at the same time they'll hold you accountable. You're now part of their knowledge system. So how you are going to engage in that knowledge after your life at the museum or at the university um, is irrelevant. All they want to make sure is that you're still part of their relationship. So the biggest part um, with my staff back in Otago is ensuring that each of them go back home to their communities, either of their origin, their source community, and or those communities they have actually done research in. It's really important from a Māori perspective as a Māori or Pacific Island researcher that you maintain that relationship. Otherwise, if you let that relationship go cold, it probably can do more damage than never having the relationship at all. So it's a, um, so it's a, you, you're, a, you're undertaking a contract in life when you enter into these communities from a community perspective. They will not put that expectation on you as for you to carry out that from your own position um, in whatever way you can give. They will accept whatever you can do and they will take into account your whole life circumstances. But um, ultimately, if uh, you are still claiming to use that knowledge for your ongoing um, career, um, I'd suggest that you maintain the relationship as best you can through that time and beyond. This is one of the times where we stopped in at a marae um, in between two venues. And these are two daughters um, of the last man to wear the cloak. And, had, and it was their um, great-great-grandmother who had killed a number of dogs and made the cloak the dogs belonging to the chiefs of the tribe that had all been slain by a, na a neighbouring tribe. Um, and so it was a process of reconciliation that we were able to um, assist in. And these are the final moments now where that uh, taonga, the ancestor, has been put in place. Oh, bit of a, one of our low-res photos, sorry. <laughs> So I'm just going to now finish with um, a, um, a couple of more video clips and, and back to my last PowerPoint. Um, it'll come on in about 90 seconds. The, the first kind of clip has only lasts for about 60 seconds is Gilbert Meir himself and the music is the bringing together of our native uh, musicians with Scottish descent musicians. Gilbert Meir was of Scottish descent and he even got his fighting party to wear kilts even though they're Māori. Well they weren't kilts proper, they were, they were blankets he got from Scotland but they'd wrap it around themselves. They could use them for warmth at night or they had them wrapped around their waist so when they went into battle it wasn't getting in the way and they became known as the um, Gilbert Meir's Tiarua flying column. And then the final clip is of some of those elders that protected us when we went from one venue to the next, when we entered into, into communities of engagement and had passed us a lot of knowledge. So I've um, captured uh, one of the, one of the um, footage, archival footage you could say, that belongs to the Kotawa experience and able to share that with you. So um, I'll let those two run pretty soon. And then the final part will be um, just a summary, one slide PowerPoint, just to finish up.
You got the copyright on that. Intellectual property. <laughs> You'll have to get a dictionary and see what that means. <laughs> So, um, just to summarize, probably you could summarize in one word, it's accountability. And to be able to flow between being academic and professional within a museum context is about, and you're dealing with indigenous values. It's how you engage with your source community and how you honour them as co-producers or co-researchers. Provide them the opportunity to engage in the museum's trajectory um, in a meaningful way. Um, and an opportunity for them to provide 
the narrative behind the ancestors so that they're presented not just by the museum but by the museum, the source community, under the mana, under the authority of the landscape on which these objects are resting or being held. Taking the objects back out into the landscape is, um, you know, can be best summarised as post-museum. It's the new space that museums appear to be entering. Um, it, was a, it was a term that didn't even exist when we were doing Kotawa, um, but has since been associated with what we've done in Kotawa. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a way of re-centering knowledge, knowledge centering. And the art of Tonga themselves, I mean, this art is cross-generational. They represent relationships that are marae framed. And how can we best create an emotional pull and do something television can't do? It's, it's about relating to descendants in real time and real space, sharing the same breadth of our ancestors um, and understanding what it means to be part of a trajectory going beyond our lifetimes. And the one place for that to occur is on the marae. That's the space of creation and ultimately is the space and the place as Māori to where we will draw our last breath and be laid to rest with our ancestors. So um, on that note, um, with this in the background, let the dead now return to the dead and let us, the living, now be part of the living again. To all of you, my warmest greetings. Kia ora koutou. Comment or question for Professor Tapsell? It's quite clear that um, this indigenous, these indigenous people have a special connection with the environment around them, but what kind of uh, spiritual significance do they place on animals and sea creatures and other things of that sort? Uh, it's all bounded in that we don't have land mammals in New Zealand, but we have fish mammals. Well, fish mammals, that's, there's an oxymoron for you. We have sea mammals like whales and porpoises, dolphins, and we have um, large fish like sharks that have deep spiritual importance to different tribes in different ways. So some of you would have seen Whale Rider, um, an indigenous movie um, that's relating back to a young woman making contact with a whale as an ancestor. Um, our tribe is known as the, wider tribe is known as the tribe of Tiarua, and Tiarua is actually a name we take from a supernatural shark that um, rescued us during one of our migrations through the islands to Aotearoa. So uh, we also, with certain birds, they are, they are seen as uh, messengers from the spirits, um, and for some tribes when a bird appears in a particular place, a particular bird can represent a, a, a death to occur within the people, for example. So, so and others as a message of warning or, or um, perhaps other meanings. So, yes, they, um, not in the same way that in North America and some of the cultures um, have a relationship with the bears and the clans that they've developed. Um, ours, I guess, is more about being um, portals to messages from our ancestors or our ancestors themselves. But yeah, maybe there is a relationship there, especially with the Northwest Indian communities. Thank you. Thank you very much for a really moving talk. And uh, I have a question about the Marae as a space of creation and about contemporary art practices uh, on the Marae, like um, Atamira Dance Company or other companies that are working within the space of the Marae and the space of contemporary Western art places. And I wonder whether you can speak a little bit about the reception of groups like Atamira within the Marae community. Mm -hmm. 
order. Waitemera is an interesting phenomenon because they mostly are the Ngaitahu people where I work now and they are coming from a culture that were almost rendered, um, but were made bereft of all marae um, in 1922 with the Runaka Act. Um, but since the settlement, marae have started to come back again and Atemura, um, Mera have been able to um, respond to marae spaces in a, you could say, in a very Ngaitahu way. Um, I'm, I'm a real fan of their work and of them creating a modern context to a marae space which is a very deep customary um, concept as Maori peoples that reaches back probably over 3,000 years into our, into our history, going right back into spaces that um, you can still see resemblances of, be it in Samoa or Tonga, up in the, up in the Micronesian islands, um, but under different names, used in different ways, but ultimately is an important space. For Maori, the space took on an extreme importance probably about 2,000 years ago as being um, for their ancestors has been a navigation spiritual space. So our, our navigation of the deep Pacific came out of concepts that are still maintained through ritual on marae. The marae um, that we see as our parent marae is in raiatia, it's called tapu tapuatia. So um, for our young people to respond to that knowledge with a modern context is exciting. Um, but also there's confusion around the marae concept when it's being captured within an ethnic Maori context without a anchoring to a tribal landscape which ultimately still exists even though the people might not want to acknowledge it. And unless that's um, ameliorated, it creates a tension with the local peoples knowing that another tribal group or a pan-tribal group are using or creating a marae space without their sanction. Um, and on a landscape that ultimately if something happens, they're still held accountable despite the despite the best intentions of that ethnic Māori group. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I had a question about, I noticed um, in some of the clips you had um, people walking a certain direction closely and kind of, and quickly, kind of quickly. And um, so I had a question about how, um, especially when we think about how, when we think about how one engages an object or knowledge via that object as a portal, as you said. How um, how much of that rested on, I mean, you know, like the placement of particular objects? Um, and and the, maybe I wonder if you could explain the, the process and in consulting with the community, the, the protocols involved in that. Um, I mean, it's just based on what I saw in the clips, I don't know how people actually were supposed to engage them. But a lot of times, I mean, you, you mentioned the conscious decision to not have labels. Um, so I wondered, were, were people able to just go up there or was that in fact what you had intent, you know, uh, intended and what, and what that was about? Okay, starting with that, going quickly? Yeah. Or appearing to go quickly compared to lingering and looking at the label? You have a couple of hundred other people following behind you and you're following the person doing the rituals, it's for that moment you are opening, you are clearing the way for the living after it being part of the dead, so you keep moving. <laughs> but some people start to linger and hold up the procession. Um, they all come back later and then they engage. But for that moment then, that was an opening and that's why we were filming it at the time, as opposed to, I don't even know if we ever got any film of people just in the context of just looking at it, so um, probably not. So yeah, that create that. I see how there's a confusion there. Um, on completion, um, there would be speeches. A marae space is is is, is um, empowered by the local people, and it usually occurred in the front of the plinth where that stone had been laid, the modi, and to be up to an hour of engagement. And usually during that time, a lot of people peel off the back and then start to just gaze up and, and, and look at their taonga. And they'll go to their taonga. And the taonga were carefully laid out in an order so that you didn't have genealogical conflict. So that it was from one tribe to the next as they have maintained their boundaries on the landscape. So from the very front we were looking at um, the tribes of the coast 
working all the way through to the central centre of the island, the tribes that were in the centre, and each of them had their own relationship. And in placing them there, it was a, really was with all that knowledge. Having, it was like a three-dimensional jigsaw, trying to make sure that the tower were in just the right position at the right place, without being too close to create tension, but at the same time not too far apart to kind of create, well, why are you too far apart? Um, and it's quite interesting how that occurred. I, I, I was walking around on the plinth about two o'clock in the morning, drilling holes, put, putting in, the, putting in the, um, the stands that are black, and then the tower on that, and it's sort of like sitting there just I sometimes up to an hour just looking at that and just seeing if it works, just thinking about the whakapapa, the genealogies of each of them and the placements. So ultimately, I had to be accountable to where they were placed. And so the very first exhibition almost died in hoping I'd got it right. Um, so, uh, so ultimately it proved that I didn't get it wrong. So it was relief. No, no sense of pride, just total relief that um, never once did anyone say, hey, that shouldn't be there. And uh, so that was my greatest fear throughout the whole nine exhibits. It was like, what's that doing there? Hey, boy, what'd you put that there for? Yeah, so I had to be careful of that. Um, and there's a third question in the mix that. Um... Oh, uh, explaining the process. And, and because I'm, I'm now can ask, <laughs> but and I was thinking particularly because you guys, you know, at, at, you, you mentioned accountability was always the talk. Yeah. And, um, so can this, accountability. This idea of reconciliation. I mean, you know, when we think of the way we exhibit in these new spaces, um, uh, and I like, you know, I like to think of this idea of post museum, but uh, we think of it as an act of decolonizing. When we think about the way Maori culture, and other Pacific Island cultures, to that matter, have been exhibited. So as a process of decolonization, um, but reconciliation. So how, explaining that process, knowing that you had accountability, reconciliation, these things. In your yeah. Yeah. All those conversations that had occurred before finally you placed that tongue in that particular place, as opposed to, oh, that looks good. It was all about, does that feel right? So it was a real feel experience, a feel developed out of consciousness of all the stories and narratives and songs and their whakapapa, their genealogy, that eventually it took that space, that place. And I only re-drilled two taonga, had to plug and re-drill the sands. And both of those were because the conservators said it was too close to the side and someone could reach over and touch. That was the only reason I re-drilled. Um, and it just, uh, you know, once it was finished and stood back and looked at it going, geez, that, I, I couldn't see it until I'd finished, that it, if it worked or not, and it just had the balance to it. And I know, I would guess people hang big exhibitions, they get into that space as well. It's no different than this case. You're having to use all that knowledge sitting around and behind and in front and above and below. And then cross your fingers and pray to die if uh, you get it wrong. So. Thanks for the powerful narrative and images. Um, I'm struck that part of the origin of this immediate project, as you described it, came from a, an action of delivering these objects in an act of trust. And I wonder how much of what has followed here derives from that and how that might differ from a person's response in a curatorial relationship to objects in another kind of institution with other localities when the objects did not come into possession of the museum through such a genealogy. In other words, if something was captured or taken or bought. There were more than one trajectory of each object that came in. Well, I should say each object had, a, had its own particular trajectory. Um, some came in um, as prestations of trust. Others came in as captured in war. Um, some represented um, literally the human remain of an ancestor, uh, while others were a, um, a carved or woven depiction of an ancestor that wasn't literal. And 
and many times the descendant groups had no knowledge anymore of that ancestor. So for them to reconnect with that ancestor by it being delivered back to them in a prestation manner, but then to have to let go and pass it on, created some really interesting conversations. And within those conversations was an acknowledgement that, it's probably the best way to describe it, it's like a hot potato. If you think of power as being a hot potato, you, you can only hold it for so long before you pass it on. And each of the tribes were balancing just how long they could hold on to this hot potato before they were happy it moved on again. So that they could hold up their head high and do everything that was required and nothing went wrong on their watch. And to finally see the relief of those elders when they were finally able to close it down and pass it on. But knowing that they had given their children that once in a lifetime that will never happen again and those time will never be together again in the same way. Um, and yet, today, seven of those taonga, eight of those taonga, are now living back in the tribal museums of origin as yet another great spin-off of what occurred. Because the museums, they are, there they said, look, we can't hold on to it ourselves because we can't, you know, we can't have it down our marae, it's too open, it's too not protected. But as our museum, can you provide that space and can we come in and be co-producers with the exhibition of that? So um, it's a new, it, it, the trajectory continues. It's going in new ways that even we couldn't predict at the time that we were pulling them together. So uh, that's uh, probably, I don't know if it exactly answers what you're saying, but... It's great to hear. Kia ora. I have one final question. Um, I was curious, uh, any critique of the exhibition, the final product? as it was exhibited at different venues, uh, from either of the two communities that you've, you've identified? Which communities? Well, you talked at the end about the fact that there is the source community, there are two source communities, yeah. Okay, um, the source communities, um, they were quite aggressive in two or three of them and saying exactly, you know, can we have these back? Um, which, knowing the elders that have since passed on, they would never have been um, as aggressive. They would have been a lot more polite, and they wouldn't have gone straight to the museum. They would have gone to the local tribe first. But the museum, that it turned out there was actually the museum behind the community that was pushing for them, because they can see there's a dollar to be made from it. And they found members within that community that... Um, also quite happy to be paid to act as the pushers. Um, and that's only occurred because of the leadership vacuums that have occurred in the last 20 years with the elders that, when I grew up, they said, if you ever ask for a taonga, you know, you are courting with trouble because those taonga, your ancestors, you don't ask for your grandfather. If anything, he'll ask for you. You know, where's your respect? And a great example is when our great ancestor Pukaki, who had been presented to the government in 1877 for, our, for the development of our township, and that's that big, tall, huge, massive carving. We presented him to the Crown. We entered into a... We're the only tribe in the country that has its own single treaty, apart from the big treaty over the whole of Māori society. We have our own individual treaty called the Fenton Agreement. That taonga represented that agreement. The receivers were Auckland Museum officials and governors, and they put the taonga, the ancestor, Pukaki, my great-great-great-great-grandfather, into the museum as their own personal gift, with no mention of the transaction and what it represented. And that ended up, when I was at the uh, Rotary Museum in 1991-92, one of the elders, who was the direct descendant of the presenter, he came to me and he said, there's something the rest of the tribe doesn't know about, but Pukaki that's up in the Auckland Museum that is now on our national coinage, we presented that with that landscape. And um, he's, because I was about to go back to university and do, um, do studies on leadership, he said, no, you're not. You're going back to find out how Pukaki ended up 
in the museum. And before he died, I was able to show him all the documents that I pulled out of the archives at the museum, the letters and the, and what had, the actualities of what had occurred within the government's own handwriting. Um, and then I presented that as my master's thesis to the Auckland Museum. That was richly presented in a ceremony um, in which Ngāti Whātua, the home people, were at, sitting next to the Auckland Museum, and this is before the new legislation had been enacted. And my tribe walks in with elders, and before we walked in, old Kuru Waka, who um, led, led our Māori battalion in the Battle of Al Alabain, in which many hundreds of our people were killed, an old war veteran, incredible mana, um, amazing elder, he turned around to the whole tribe and in particular pointed at some of the young radicals that are in our group, and he says, if I hear just any, just one of you ask for Pukaki back, you're out of that room before you can take another breath. You will sit there, you will shut up, Pukaki will decide if he's coming home, not us. So we went in, we sat down, first half hour of the engagement was all in Māori, and it was about, as always, honouring the hosts and the hosts honouring the visitors, but you don't speak about why you were there. You speak about all the ancestors that came before, you speak about the relationships and the differences. Notwithstanding, the next day I actually ended up marrying their daughter. Um, my wife was a little bit upset that I actually was part of this. Um, and then, when finally all had been said and done in Māori, and we knew who we were in kin relationships going back 20 generations, the first word spoken in English by those who didn't understand a word that was going on was by the director and the first thing he said, and there's my thesis laying on the floor between us, he said, the Auckland Museum accepts and admits that you, Ngāti Whakaui, still own Pukaki. I was sitting right behind my elder, Kuru, he rocks back, I push him back forward, jumps up, walks over, does the hongi and says, well that's it. And yeah, it was like, the museum had, as far as he's concerned, Pukaki had spoken to that Englishman, that English uh, Pākehā fellow. And exactly to the day, 120 years later, from when he was presented, Pukaki was presented back by Ngāti Whātua, the home people, and the Auckland Museum, back onto the marae from which he had come. And then that afternoon, the Governor General, so we, there was about 2,000 of us who were able to meet him again and be part of him. And then that afternoon, the elders then presented him to the government and completed the transaction that had started in 1877 to remind the government exactly why we'd given that land and why we had a treaty. What the most powerful symbol of trust you could present. Notwithstanding, it's on every coin, 20 cent coin in New Zealand now as well. Another story, but um, maybe that'll at least in one instance. Now that's the source community, Pukaki, and the home community, Ngāti Whātua, engaging directly in a Māori relationship, Māori values, marae context, and the museum unwittingly went along for the ride, and then by the time they realised what was happening, they couldn't pull out. I mean, like within hours, they're saying, oh God, what did that director say? How did, you know, his, his trust board tore into it. They were not happy, <laughs> but it was like the wheels started going in motion. Pukaki came home, Ngāti Whātua brought him home. Ngāti Whātua lifted up this 560 kilogram, sorry, 350 kilogram carving. Four of them were able to carry him onto the truck, a truck that was the old truck we used for delivering firewood in our tribe. And the wind, only one windscreen wiper, more rust than anything else. And I remember sitting in the front of one of my elders saying, is this truck going to make it home? And he turned around, another elder, he says, don't ask me, ask Pukaki. It's like, oh, okay, I guess it will. If he wants to go home, he'll go home. And sure enough, we made it all the way home. Um, and when we arrive home, just to be greeted by the wall of all his descendants there, um, it was probably the most incredible moments in my life to, because then you're seen Pukaki a thousand times, times two over. Every one of them was Pukaki. We were, we were ancestral time collapsed into one. And that's the magic of, um, for our, from our perspective, what it means to be Māori in a tribal context. So. Wonderful. Thanks so much for a very, very inspiring Thank you, presentation. Ray.